Nietzsche's rejection of Wagner coincided with a similarly radical change in his own life and work. Whilst he continued to teach in Basel, he began to have severe doubts as to whether it was here that his future lay. He still believed that it was through liberating the creative Dionysian spirit that greatness could be achieved. But he began to doubt that the answer lay with the transformation of the masses. Instead, it was the flourishing of great visionary individuals that would hold the key to the future. And he was convinced that the petty responsibilities of academic life were suffocating his own creative genius. He conceived a deep dread of coming back here to lecture to what he called the greatest curse of his life. Depressed and anxious, he developed what he called Baselophobia. Nietzsche longed to break free. The key to life, he wrote, was to live dangerously. On the 2nd of May, 1879, he resigned his professorship. As Nietzsche left Basel, he was gripped by debilitating ill health. Since childhood, he'd been plagued by violent stomach pains and blinding headaches. And haunted by the fear that he too would be struck down by the disease that killed his father, Nietzsche's physical challenges had been the final trigger for his resignation. Although his doctors warned that excessive reading and writing would cause him to go blind, nothing was going to stop his pursuit of a life of philosophy. Nietzsche began to crisscross Europe, staying in hotels and guest houses in climates that alleviated his medical symptoms. He would spend the rest of his sane adult life in a state of nomadic solitude. You can just imagine him, ill, troubled, increasingly isolated, and yet with this extraordinary mind for company. Over the next decade, the ideas and thoughts that poured onto the page were simply astonishing. His ill health would mean that he could only write in bursts of 20 minutes at a time. So his books were full of incisive aphorisms, pithy statements, rather than long philosophical treatises. And it was on a train in 1881 that he was told about somewhere that would provide the inspiration for many of these great works. A fellow traveler recommended that he visit a place called Sils Maria just a tiny little farming village in the Swiss mountains. He followed their advice and discovered the place that would become his spiritual homeland. On Monday, the 4th of July, 1881, Nietzsche fell in love at first sight with Sils Maria. Its mountains and forests inspired his most life-affirming ideas. Its beauty reinforced for him the sheer magnificence of existence. And it was on one of his walks here, a month after he'd arrived, that Nietzsche had what he believed was the most important thought he'd ever conceived. He was walking by this lake when he stopped next to this rock and suddenly had a vision. This was a thought experiment that Nietzsche believed would help us all to analyze every action, every decision of our lives so that we could live those to the full. This was his question. If a demon were to whisper in your ear that you had to live your life as lived, time and time again throughout eternity with all the pain and with all the greatness would you fall to the ground and gnash your teeth and curse that demon or would you say that he was a god and that his utterances were divine 
It was an idea that became known as the eternal recurrence of the same. And it formed the very essence of Nietzsche's attitude to life, to both its joys and its hardships. Nietzsche believed that even though we all have things that we might consider failures, the breakup of a relationship or the death of a loved one, we should be happy to relive those events too. Just as a pianist learns to master improvisations, so we should learn to incorporate mistakes and imperfections and sorrows into the beauty of the whole. We should construct our lives so we are our own heroes. Um, basically, we should decide who we want to be, how we want to live our life, and then love the choices that we've made. So that the thought of reliving our existence, for good and for bad, can be greeted with a life-affirming yes. The Eternal Return was an exuberant and optimistic embrace of life. Suffering wasn't something that you had to be redeemed from, as Christianity taught, or avoided at all costs, as Schopenhauer argued. Instead, it was to be embraced, mastered. To live life most fully, one had to risk suffering and overcome it. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger is one of Nietzsche's most iconic phrases. And it was one that he himself was just about to have to put to the test.